wiped out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely from. Hello and welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Nazar, not Jason Calacanis. I'm guest hosting this week. Our regular host, Jason, is at the World Series of Poker. He's at the second day. We hear that he's a little short stack long. But a little bit. He's, he's, he was much worse off yesterday than he is today. He's, he's climbed back a little bit. But uh, Jason, we're wishing you well. We're all sending you good thoughts. And the rumor is that you've already knocked out uh, one of the top players in the tournament. So. Uh, I think you've always done pretty well with the underdog status, so even if you're a little short stacked, I think you're going to be doing just fine and we're all rooting for you over here. And of course we're joined by our wonderful, smart, handsome, successful guests, J.R. Johnson from Lunch.com. J.R., thanks for joining us today. Uh, well, thanks for having me, guys. So uh, we're in for a real good show today, and I know it's a little bit of a departure from uh, the normal Jason, but we're going to try to make this as exciting and interesting for everyone out there as possible. Uh, so just to start off, I wanted to thank our streaming partner, Ustream, a fantastic, amazing service. You all know it. Uh, streaming live videos, watching recorded videos afterwards. Uh, they've been with us here at the show since the beginning and uh, really just been a fantastic partner. Never any glitches. World-class uh, service. I know the founders. They're great guys uh, and just very thankful for everything they've done for us. So I believe the first segment is Ask Jason. Yes, let's we can go right to the caller. We and we didn't even have to change the name of the segment. <laughs> I don't think that's nice. very clever. Nice. So I think we've got Scott Klein. Hello. Hey, Scott, you're on the air on This Week in Startups. How's it going, man? It's going great. Nice to have you with us. Good, thank you. So uh, my question today is yesterday or last week we, uh, we launched our first uh, web startup. It's me and my brother. And uh, we're just bootstrapping it. So we put it out there, um, getting some decent traffic and uh, getting some good customers. So it's nice to have some money coming in. My question today is, we're coming in, I guess you could say, second uh, to the technology space that we're in. Um, and I'm wondering, how is it going to affect our company if we're starting to price it really aggressively um, in order to grab as much market share as we can as quick as possible to start competing uh, with our competitors? Okay. So, Scott, do you feel comfortable telling us a little bit more about your business and what you do? Yeah, so the name of the business is um, Sound Around, and you can visit Scott, the, the website. the first rule of thumb is you always got to promote your business, first <laughs> off. <laughs> I was trying to uh, avoid the shameless plug. Um, anyways, the website is www.getsoundaround.com, kind of like Get Dropbox. Anyway, uh, what we do is we, we provide a platform for bands and um, live performers to kind of create their own iPhone and, and Android applications. So we started uh, with just Android. You know, our minimum viable product, I guess you could say, is uh, just on the iPhone right now. And so our, our existing competitor, uh, I don't know if you want me to drop the name, um, but they have about 250 apps in the store right now. And so we're really looking to grab a lot of market share and a lot of visibility as much as possible because the majority of people we talk to say, hey, this is a great idea. Why has nobody done this? Uh, you know, lo and behold, it's, it's been around for a little bit. So we're struggling with a little bit of um, a visibility issue right now. And I think that it's somewhat sponsoring and, and pricing really aggressively and cutting deals with some distributors uh, that might not necessarily be as profitable as we want to be, uh, but will definitely increase kind of the visibility of the technology. You know, how is that going to help? But also on the flip side, um, what are the consequences to our product, to our company? I don't want to risk damaging us as kind of the, the cheap alternative as opposed to the inexpensive. Yeah. And so what specifically is the app doing? It's helping to promote bands? Yeah, so right now it's pretty much an electronic press kit that they can upload their songs, their videos, uh, their photos, uh, a little bit of info, links to their MySpace, their Facebook, things like that. Okay. Um, and so eventually we're going to get into some cooler stuff, but right now we're, uh, it's just it's basically, uh, I guess you could say a MySpace version on the web. Um, but it allows the fans to participate with Facebook and MySpace um, to check in at shows, that kind of stuff. And, and where, where are you based out of? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Gotcha. And, and does your little stuffed animal go with you everywhere you go into all your meetings? Yeah, yeah. So the giraffe back there, that's Shirley. Uh, she's kind of our mascot. We just uh, figured gotcha. it would be a good How habit. come we don't have a stuffed animal mascot? We, we should have a bulldog. We should have something here. That should be the here. This Week in Start. That's kind of the This Week in Start. I don't know. Mascot. A plate of food, of lunch food, or something. I don't know. All right. So, Scott, first off, congratulations Thank you. on getting your business off the ground. And to this part, that's no small achievement. Right. Uh, and um, you should be proud of everything you've accomplished so far. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, I wouldn't worry about being second to market. Our goal as you know, business owners and people running businesses is to do things different and better than what everyone else does. 
So that means if you've already got a competitor in the market or even if you're doing something similar to what other people do, that's fine. A lot of the best businesses aren't completely new ideas. They're taking things that already exist and just doing it different and better. And yeah. my first recommendation to you would be a lot of times as new entrepreneurs or younger entrepreneurs, we think in order to get business, we always have to cut our prices. And a lot of times you really don't need to do that. And so I wouldn't start there. I mean, definitely going after market share is important. And if the best way to do that that you find out over time is to provide competitive pricing, I would do that. But first, I would start with your product. And at the end of the day, if you hustle more and are better and more creative at marketing and better at reaching bands and better at communicating to them what your value proposition is, you don't have to offer it for less. And a lot of times, we default to the fact that we think we have to offer our product or service for less because it's newer. And that's not the case. If over time that turns out to be your advantage, you know, I think you could do that. JR, okay. what do you think? Well, I think the piece you brought up originally when he first came on the air was that, uh, first of all, Jason's an expert in promoting and representing himself so well. He's taught me a lot about just how to do that and how to be proud of that. And, and the piece that I would say would be, um, even before he was able to tell us what the name of the company was and what he was actually doing, he told us he was second to market, or he was second in technology. He was, he was already kind of discounting what he was talking about. It's like, it's nice having the giraffe there. I'd like to have the banner of, of, your, uh, of the site behind there so I could see what that is. And it's, we go to conferences, I'll see Jason at a, at a conference, and everybody will be in suits, everybody will be dressed up. He'll be wearing his Doc Stock t-shirt out there because he's yeah. constantly promoting, constantly putting it out there so everybody knows who he is and what Doc Stock is. And it's something that's like, it's tough because you know the space. And you know that you don't want to come off as too cocky or pushing it too much, but the fact that you're second to market or you're second in technology, half the people aren't going to know that. You don't need to lead with that and you don't need to tell them that. It's one yeah, of those things that's, it's, I just put it out there, be proud of it and go all the way with it. And it's something that I can tell you as, as an entrepreneur myself, it's tough to do and it's something that hasn't come naturally to me. My style would be, has, has been more like yours and I'm trying to get more there myself as far as promoting my business. But that's, um, I don't know, that's, that's one little piece of... Uh, one little piece of that offer. Yeah, and we've definitely differentiated the product, I think, from a, from a feature standpoint. Um, but we have been tracking their growth over the last you know, six months or so, and it's definitely doing somewhat of a hockey stick approach. I think as word of mouth starts to spread more and more about their growth, and so we're, we're thinking about kind of you know, how can we jumpstart that. So if we, if we sponsor, let's say, 50 apps right off the bat, is that increased visibility right off the bat going to allow us to uh, move the curve up a little bit, if that makes sense? So just three final points that I, I'd consider. The first is that, A, don't ever discount hustle. The fact that they're already in the market and successful means there's a lot of things they're probably not going to do because they don't need to. Right. And you need to, right? You're there right. and you're yeah. hanging out in your blue t-shirt with your giraffe, keeping yes. you company, and you've got to hustle more and, and work harder. But that means you're going to do certain things that they're not. And that's going to make up for getting a lot of customers that they're just not going to go after. Okay. The second thing is that if using a discounted price strategy is going to help you gain market share, then what I would try to do is do it for a period of time and then set your pricing higher again. So you may want to say our app is 50% off for the first year and then it goes up after that. Because really the way in which you price your product is really key and you don't want to have to be getting three times as many sales because you felt in the beginning that you had to discount a valuable offer. And then the third thing is I really would do some financial modeling and see what's the price point you need and t make an assumption of how many sales you think you're going to get. And whatever that assumption is, cut it in half or buy a third. And then say, if that's the case, what do we need to price our product at to hit the milestones and metrics that we need to do to either keep growing this business on cash flow or to be able to raise money for it? Okay. Makes sense? So for, yeah, so for, I, I guess if you could give an example for DocStock, for somebody who came in to do advertising, um, was it appropriate for you to uh, offer a lower price to begin with, knowing that in the future you could raise it just to get the initial people on board, or did you start with a consistent price right from day one? So that's a good question. I mean, we, so we sell a lot of documents on DocStock, and we also have a subscription product, and we're constantly doing price testing. So we just don't guess. We let our users tell us. And we'll A-B test different price products. And what we've often found is when you increase your price, there's a percent drop off of people that will buy or subscribe, 10, 20%. But we're often able to double the price of which we sell a product for 
And so it more than makes up for it. And so okay. you'll be interested to find that if you clearly communicate your value and re you reach a lot of people and you offer something that's meaningful, there's a less price sensitivity than you think there might be. Right? Because I'm assuming, you know, what's the pricing of your app that you're looking at right now? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's software as a service. It's tiered based on usage. So our beginning plan is $14 a month. Yeah. That's just really so it, if I'm a band and I want to get myself out there, and there's one app that I feel does a better job versus the other, I don't really care if I'm paying $14 a month or 30 or 45 I just want the tools that I need. And so I, I think those were a great set of questions, and I wish you luck in your business. Yeah, uh, and, you and, and ping us, JR, at JR Lunch, that's your Twitter handle? JR Lunch, yeah. Um, at Jason Azar, drop us a line and let us know how you're doing, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Good luck. You got it. See ya. All right, so that segment of Ask Jason was brought to us by uh, DNA Mail. DNA Mail is a hosted email solution for your company. Really fantastic service. Can do a lot of the things that... Um, DNA uh, Mail, DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail, as yeah. Jason, our, our usual Jason would say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, complete hosted exchange, uh, you know, SharePoint, CRM. Mailboxes start as low as $2.95 on DNA Mail. Uh, great service. You can uh, manage, import all your mailboxes. They'll handle it all for you. Why host your own mail server? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, so DNA Mail offers... Uh, you know, a convenient, easy, uh, cost-effective solution. And uh, one thing Jason always asks people to do that you guys can do is uh, go on to Twitter and thank all of our sponsors, including at DNA Mail, uh, for sponsoring the show. They, we, we couldn't do it without them. Great. And so prices start at... It starts as low at as two ninety five a month for mailboxes. And I mean, that would be, you know, a smaller sort of personal mailbox, but they have solutions for basically as large a company as you have and as many emails as you're dealing with every day, they have a solution. Great. Well, if someone wants to try... Uh, at, let's just throw out some random offers. If someone wants to try uh, DNA Mail, give it a shot. If you're going to do the subscription service that costs $10 a month or not, the first person that uh, tweets, hi, at Jason Azar, hi, at JR at lunch, I want to try DNA Mail, we'll sign you up for the service and see if you like it. There you go. Wow. A All deal. Right. Give it a try, somebody. <laughs> All right, so help us find that person, and we can yeah, we'll uh, they'll they'll look for it out there. As long as they they should tweet uh, at DNA Mail at Jason Nazar at JR Lunch. Tweet all three of those names, we'll find you. Great. So we'll pick one person by the end of the show. All right, so it looks like we've got the next segment, Jason's Shark Tank. Uh, and we got, this... we got an intro here. We got to we got to play the intro. <laughs> all right, let's go on to that. I like how Jason Calacanis' <laughs> images was superimposed exactly next to the shark. <laughs> I don't know what the shark is. The, the, you know, the animal floating, well, I guess it's not an animal, but the fish floating around in the water or Jason? So uh, we have, Jason who do we have here shark. with us? Uh, we have Scott McIntosh, uh, and he, his company is Music Pitch. I'm going to pull it up here on the computer. And uh, so we'll put one minute on the clock. So first off, Scott, before you even start, is McIntosh your real name or did you... You know, is this your pen tech name? Because that's a great um, name. It's actually Macintosh, even though I use a PC. Wow. So it's, it's, but I do have an iPhone. I, am an, I do love the iPhone. And you brand all your shirts with your last name, Mazel Tov. That's great. That's well, it matches the company. It all kind of works out. So. All right, Scott, let's hear your, your, your pitch, and we're going to shark it up afterwards. One minute on the clock, starting now. All right, Music Pitch is a web application that allows anybody to get custom music created for any type of project. So whether you're looking for an advertising jingle for your company, whether you're looking for background music for film, you can get a custom score made for your home video that you recorded of your family. Uh, you can get custom songs made, made as gifts. So if you want to give somebody a gift as a present, now think about wedding songs. You can get custom wedding songs made so couples can finally dance to their song. Um, and, you know, there's, there's plenty of uses for custom music. If you watch TV, every commercial has a custom song on it. Uh, I noticed your video, when you open, you play Empire State of Mind. I wonder if you guys actually have a license for that song. Why not get a custom song that you can brand uh, this week in with? Uh, we charge $39 to the contest holder to run a con contest for the music, plus 10% of their prize amount. Songwriters around the world compose to, uh, to try to win the contest, and then uh, the contest holder gets the song, signer gets the prize. Easy. And time. Yes. Boom. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so uh, first off, it sounds like a great business. And you started this? I did. I did. I had the idea January 3rd uh, this year. Talked to some Nashville Angels. They funded it. 
We launched April 28th. And where are you based out of? Nashville, Tennessee, the Great. songwriting capital of the world. Well, well, congratulations. I hope uh, you and Taylor Swift are having a good time hanging out <laughs> together. Uh, so first off, let's talk about your pitch. And okay. uh, so you spent about 40 seconds of your pitch talking about the value of custom songs. Right. And that could probably be done in about five seconds. I think, okay. we, uh, and, and you did a good job of giving different examples. But you were rushing all through the end, and I don't really understand your business. I don't really understand how you make money. I don't understand, is this, you know, where the distribution for this is. And so I think you've, you've left out some, some parts of it. I, I don't really know anything about the founders. And for example, if you're at a cocktail party and you have a chance to talk to an angel or venture capitalist, you're really only going to have a minute of their mind share, and those are important things to communicate. So it sounds like it, I understand what you do, and that's, that's really good that you communicated that, because you'd be surprised how many pitches people give that at the end of the pitch, and it could be a lot longer than a minute, you still don't really understand what they do. So you did that, and that's the most important thing. But I don't know how you really monetize your business. I don't know what stage of your business you're at in. I don't know who the founders are, and I don't know what your needs in the, are in the business, and I don't know how far along you are. And those are key important things I think you need to communicate in any pitch. JR, any other feedback? Yeah, my, uh, I thought uh, the one, my only feedback is kind of opposite of what you were saying, though, because he spent a lot of time laying out exactly what the need is. And I wasn't sure, as he was talking about it, I wasn't sure if, I don't understand, the, I don't know the space that well, so let me caveat it by saying that, but um, do people really need a lot of custom songs? I, I didn't get that uh, out of it. I didn't know if I would be willing to pay for a custom song. The first thing I was thinking was, well, how good is this song going to be when I'd rather dance, you know, if I'm getting married, I'd rather dance to a popular song than to a you know, a song composed by somebody who I don't know who it is and I'm not sure yeah, if but it's going to be that Yeah, lots of examples, good. right? I mean, if you're doing a video and you need music for the background. Right, but even for, even he used the example here, it's like they've got the, the uh, Jay-Z song leading this one off and the question about the license until it's at the point where Jay-Z's cracking down on you guys for not having a license to using, <laughs> hey, to let's using not, his song. Let's not get any crazy <laughs> ideas here, all right? I don't know if I'm, I, I don't know, I, I just don't know how big the market is. So that was, that was one of the things that I wasn't sure about when, when he was going through it. But he did give some good examples. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point. Maybe just to throw out there, you know, the uh, amount of dollars that's spent every year on creating custom music for film, video, personal loot. Yeah, yes, kind of, I, yeah, I who, yeah, who the customer is, who's really going to be using it. Because the, the wedding piece, I was, I, as a user, I was like, oh, I'm not sure that's too compelling. But if I knew exactly how many people are buying all these songs for commercials, for all these different things, to really kind of put some numbers behind what the market size is, that would be a little more compelling. I think. So I'm assuming, Scott, what you do is somebody goes somewhere online and says what kind of custom music they need and fill out some requirements, and then you broker the relationship between that person and someone that can actually create the music, and then you, you take a percentage of it? Is that how it works? No, we just host, uh, we allow anybody looking for custom music to run a contest. And what they do is they describe exactly what they need. If they got to upload, let's say they have a video they want to score, they can upload the video. Uh, they can describe the business for the jingle. Uh, they can upload matching MP3s that they're looking to to mimic that type of music. And then they set the price they want to pay, which is basically the prize of the contest. And then any songwriter around the world can compose the song and upload it and compete in the contest. So my the first contest, question, my first question is, why a contest? Why not just say here's Here's the kind of music I need. Here's the kind of jingle I need. Here's what I'm willing to pay and take a bid like an Elance or Guru. Because if I'm a music creator, I'm not sure I want to spend my time creating something to then compete with a lot of other people that may not even, even be used in the end. All right. I mean, that's, and that's the chance you take to compete. I mean, we don't charge anything for the songwriters to compete. We call it a contest because, I mean, that's basically what it is. It's a contest to see who can write the best song for this project. Um, and the winner is selected by the contest holder, he gets a license to use that song, and the, and the songwriter gets that full prize amount. We don't take any ownership of the music, we just host the contest. So one of the things I'd recommend is, you know, think about how you might want to emulate the eBay model, right? eBay has a system where you can have an auction where multiple right. people can bid up so that ultimately you get the, the best price, the most efficient price for the market for the buyer and seller. But then they also have just a buy it now option which means as a seller, if I get this price, I know I'm willing to sell it. And what you may find is that you're going to be a lot more successful at attracting supply, which are the people that are going to produce the music. We don't actually have that issue at all. We have 
tons of songwriters competing, composing amazing music. The, the, our biggest issue is getting people to run contests. Is we, when we first launched, we were targeting two markets, we were, which is difficult, as anybody knows. We were targeting, we were trying to let the songwriters become aware of the service, and we were letting people that needed custom music become aware of the service. Uh, some of our main initial targets, music supervisors, uh, wedding planners, people in the film industry, advertising agencies. It turned out that the songwriters uh, loved the service. I mean, the feedback I get from them is they, they really enjoy it. Uh, they enjoy competing. They, they like they like seeing the projects. They like that we don't charge any fees for them at all. Uh, it's, it's, it's convincing the, the people that have been getting custom music a certain way for years that we have what we think is a better way for them to get custom music because now they can choose their own price that they're willing to pay for their budget and then they're going to get a ton of choices. I mean, if you look at our example, uh, you know, we've had some great contests that have already run. We had a, a local company actually called The Local Taco, which is a taco restaurant here in town. They ran a $1,000 jingle contest. They had over 60 entries, you know, 60 jingles composed for their, for, their local, for their local jingle to pick from, and they get to pick whichever one they want. I mean, the top, the top 20 were, were, I thought, absolutely phenomenal. So I think that's great. I mean, then you just have your, your classic marketing situation where you're trying to get people to put in. Now, where do you make money in the process? We charge the contest holder a $39 flat fee plus 10% of whatever the prize amount is that they set. So whatever if you ran a $1,000 contest, up. you're going to pay $1,139. Yeah, it seems to work a lot like 99 Designs, where you basically exactly, go in. Yeah. Yes. It's exactly like 99 Designs. You we, design we a up. contest, you say, here's what I'll pay the winner, and then a bunch of people all submit. We actually have the local taco one uh, up. Maybe we can try to play a little bit of it. Yeah, let's hear that. <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure they were high when they wrote that song. I think everyone in the studio is looking I totally, around. I totally want a taco some right now. Some alternative really I feel really lazy. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Oddly enough, I want to go to Ben Harper and Jack Johnson concert right now. But that's that's a great. So that that's pretty amazing. First off, if you've got that, you know, many people interested in producing the songs and. and if you have that, then it's probably pretty straightforward. You know, buying traffic online, virally getting the word out, doing promotions on Twitter and Facebook to capture the right, audience, other audience. What I would recommend is you may find as you continue to scale the company, so as you get more and more people using your service, both on the side of people that need the music and supply it, that a contest may not always be the most efficient way. And it may be the thing that you need to do to get your name out there in the beginning. But you may want to consider that perhaps someone looking for music doesn't want to have to go through the process of setting up a contest. And one of the things I can say is most often the services that take off on the internet are those that are just dead simple and easy for people to understand and use. And if running a contest is someone that's looking for inventory of music is something that's going to make it easier and more appealing, that's great. But if it's not, I would consider giving them options of potentially just being able to buy the music directly, not only maybe if, maybe the people producing the music are fine going through the contest, but you may find that the people that are asking for the music want a more straightforward approach. And you'll find that out. I don't know what the answer is, uh, okay. but I think that I think that through. I'd lead with that local taco or the lazy taco example too when you <laughs> pitch a thing because that's yeah. great. If like you put a thousand dollars out there, you get sixty songs. Like you get it right there. It's like, and then I understand who the who the the audience is as well. It's you know if it's a local business and wants a jingle, it's like okay that makes sense. And I can have sixty songs to choose from. It's like, I get it there. Yeah, my my That's feedback is as a as a content creator, somebody we're making tons of videos, we're putting out there. Like that to me seems like the most compelling use case for this. More so than I mean you know I'm sure people want custom songs for special occasions, weddings and bar mitzvahs and whatever. But uh, I, I can totally see the need for I'm making a vlog or I'm making a web video and you know not everybody wants to you if you use a Jay-Z song or something you can get pulled you don't get your AdSense revenue from YouTube uh, if you have a custom song and you know it doesn't even have to be that expensive I saw a contest in here for like 50 bucks or something I mean that would be fantastic you know to, to just be able to have somebody write like a really cool little song play in the background and you don't have to worry about copyright or any of yeah. those other mm -hmm. issues that's a that's a brilliant use case for this I think I so, think the new so technology one, one last... so much easier you know these days for people to, to, to cut 
those scores, you know, Logic Studio with the Max and, and you, you can, I mean, you can almost compose a whole score right now on your iPhone with an application, so. So one last point, Scott, before we break. Uh, first off, I, I think this is a great business, especially in this environment, because I, what you've done is built a business that can scale based upon revenue. It doesn't seem like you need to raise a lot of money up front. Each new, cus each new user that you get is providing you revenue. And this is really a model that I think more entrepreneurs should be following for businesses online where you're out the, out the bat providing value and charging for that value provide. What I would think through is it's going to be difficult for you to build your business with lots of onesies, one off, right? So it's very hard to find that first customer and to say that you're going to get 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. I mean, think how this gets to be a big business. Let's say you want to do $5 million, you know, in revenue and you're charging people $40. You're talking about tens of thousands of users you need to get. So right. really what you want to be able to do is say when you get, you want to target those folks that are going to use the service multiple times, right? And these are maybe independent filmmakers. They're people that are producing videos online. They're people that, you know, work in any number of entertainment. And probably what you want to do is offer some kind of tiered pricing. You both want to target them in your marketing strategy and offer tiered pricing where maybe more of it's around the commission or uh, it's easier to get in because what you're really going to want to do is find someone that's going to want to get multiple songs done because it's going to be a long, hard road to get lots of individual persons. And it's going to be hard to build a big business based upon a million people giving you $39 and taking 10% of that. So I would right. focus on that. But I think you're off to a great start. So congratulations. And you made it through this round of the Shark Tank. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And I still think this weekend needs a custom song. So. I recommend music pitch. More, more than one. We may, we may give it a try. We need about uh, 15 to 18 custom songs, actually. Um, Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. So I one think... thing we should throw to the chat room, uh, which we like to do here, is everybody rate what you thought of the pitch and the idea. So P and then 1 to 10, and then I and 1 to 10. What do you think of the concept, the, the site, music pitch, and then what you think of the, uh, the, the, the actual pitch that uh, we heard from Scott? So go ahead and throw that into the chat room, and we'll, we'll read some <laughs> results. I think, chat, our, I, think our first Scott, uh, I think our first Scott can learn a lot from our second Scott. <laughs> right? If Scots our, if our first Scott was a little low on the self-promotion side, the second Scott's like, hey, let's cut a deal right now. I'm ready to go. I'm going to give you guys a break in your song right now. I'm calling Jay-Z and making sure that he sues you so I can give you your song. So thanks for counterbalancing the self-promotion side. We appreciate it. All right, and so along with a, good, a little bit of good, healthy promotion, we wanted to thank our next sponsor, WebSpy. WebSpy is a fantastic service where uh, you can check and see what uh, the people in your company are checking online, if they're on Facebook, if they're on Twitter, if they're doing something a little bit more uh, nefarious or unwelcome than even that. You can monitor all kinds of server activity, you can, you can good and bad. You can monitor all kinds of activity. I think it's personally really helpful. I think I'm going to do it just to make sure that the folks in my office aren't you know, on lunch.com too much during the day. Whoa, whoa. Because oh. let's face That's it, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> lunch.com is taking up a lot of the time at Docstock right now, and they're just building communities, and it's a great thing to do in their off time. But when you're working, I mean, come on, JR. I spent a lot of time on Docstock yesterday, too. I appreciate that. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll have I a I didn't click on any ads, though, for you. We'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a cap and trade system. <laughs> Every hour someone spends on lunch.com, you get five minutes on Docstock. I like it. I think yeah. it sounds fair. <laughs> All right, so I think now we're going actually to the official interview Let's section. do the interview, yeah. All right, so uh, let's start off by uh, thanking our sponsor for the interview section, which is Power VPS. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Power VPS? I know they provide cloud solutions for yes, hosting. Yes, you're, you're powered by the cloud. It's most cost effective to have your hosting outsourced. You don't want to you don't want to host it yourself. It's so much trouble. Everything's in the cloud now. That's where the whole industry is going. So uh, 30 ba 30 day money back guarantee. They can upgrade to fit your growing needs. Uh, lots of different packages depending on the size of your site and your needs. Just go to PowerVPS.com and check out uh, everything you need to know for virtual and dedicated website hosting. They've got over a decade of experience. I mean, they're they're gonna uh, they're going to get your site up. It's no no problems, no hiccups. Uh, I think we were running this weekend on Power VPS for a while. Uh, it, it works great. So at Power VPS, thank them on Twitter. Check out the site powervps.com uh, and you know get get in the cloud. We got a whole show this week in cloud computing. Lon, you're, going. Quite, you're quite the pitch person, yeah, Lon. I think nice. you've got a future yeah, career in this. Good. I do. I do what I can. You know, I could kind of picture you in 1950, <laughs> like you know, after the. Variety show comes on talking yeah. about soap and detergent. My and Lucky Strikes are <laughs> the best brand out there. No, I got a, I got a kind of a Billy Mays thing going I'm yeah. working on, yeah. It's working. I like it. Orange it Glow. Check it out. Yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, in the studio with us today, we have a good friend of mine, J.R. Johnson. J.R. is a multiple-time entrepreneur. Uh, the last business that he started and sold was Virtual Taurus. We'll talk about that. And his most recent business is Lunch.com, which is an amazing site that brings people to build, together to build communities and to gather on topics, user-generated content. Uh, really one of the foremost, I think, experts on user-generated content, having now started their second business around that. Uh, and really just a very talented, smart, successful entrepreneur. Uh, started off you know, as an attorney, went through law school, and then, you know, speaking from experience, having done that, made a switch that's pretty difficult, actually leaving a law practice and doing something entrepreneurial. Uh, so just really excited to have you here today and hear more about your story. It wasn't uh, that difficult for me. I was a terrible, I tell everybody, I was a terrible lawyer. So it was an easy, it was an easy transition for me, but thank you. You got it. So JR, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, to start off, let's just, you know, go through a little bit of background and give some context, you know, to your story. Uh, so, you know, you're an LA, you're a Southern California native, right? Yep. And so you grew up out here. Were your was your family entrepreneurial? Did you have a role model that you looked to growing up? Um, no, actually, no. My family they're lawyers, so it was uh, it was kind of the uh, the reverse conditioning, I guess, of seeing the life of what the the lifestyle of a lawyer and what those how hard my grandpa worked, how hard my dad worked to to go through that stuff to realize that that wasn't necessarily the lifestyle that I wanted and the. It wasn't really what I wanted to do with myself. Like you know, like when you're a lawyer, everything that you're doing is staying within the rules and staying trying to, trying to you know conform with precedent that was set in the past and and everything. There's not a lot of creativity involved for most people in the law. When you get to the upper echelon, you know where you're actually creating stuff and you're coming up with things. There is some creativity in there, but for the most part, you're just kind of. Uh, I tell people, I wasn't doing litigation, I was doing uh, transactional stuff, mm -hmm. corporate security stuff. So I felt like you're kind of just a high-priced janitor, where you're just kind of there cleaning up people's messes, they're paying you a lot of money for it, but it's not your own thing for one. And secondly, there's not a lot of creativity involved when you're sitting there following forms and just trying to keep everybody within the lines. So. So, so did you have the entrepreneurial bug growing up? I mean, were there little side ventures or businesses that you were doing, you know, yeah. through college? Yeah. Well, yeah. From little kid growing up to uh, riding down finding the guy that made the model airplanes in the little industrial park down by the house and taking them to the fourth grade class and selling them and you know stuff like that I don't know where it came from I don't know how I think some people just have it some people don't I, I'm not sure but yeah no all, all the way growing up all the way through through college from uh, in college it was uh, it got a little we ran a uh, ran a book making operation so we took a lot of bets in college that was our business at the so you're like the, the kid from Boiler Room. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go your, your dad, who was the judge, came in and broke up your booking business. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, thank God we didn't get it broken up. But okay. it, it was, uh, yeah, I can talk about that. The statute, I think, is run on the on the uh, illegal bookmaking operation that we I ran in, so in high school or in college. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So um, where'd you do undergrad at? USC. All right. So did undergrad at USC. And then did you go to law school right after undergrad? I took a year off, worked at some hedge fund, like trading stocks, and then went to law school a year So you after. really are boiler. I mean, you followed that. <laughs> yeah, now, that, now, that now that you're, uh, yeah, thanks, man. Got yeah. you. Yeah. All right. I'm sharing, I'm a, little, I'm sharing a little too much here. I got I, I to gotta scale it back. <laughs> we got to pull the reins back a little bit on this. Okay. So uh, you, you're at USC. You got the entrepreneurial bug. You've been doing. I went through things. the entrepreneur program at USC too, so I kind of knew right. that's what that's what I wanted to do. So I go from the entrepreneur program, going through the stuff, and at the time it was a fantastic program. I'm not sure how they're running it now, but it was just they had a lot of just guest speakers coming in, for other entrepreneurs, a lot of them that went through USC, how they started their business, what they how they did it, and it was really inspirational seeing all of these guys go through and you know they just you know tell some more stories, talk about their success. And you had told me you and I were having lunch, and you were saying how important that was for you. It was that it you was, had a chance to yeah. see all these people and hear their stories. It was, um, yeah, it was. I, I wouldn't be doing had I not gone through that program. I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And did you did you picture yourself? I mean, because I think what a lot of us do is you, you, know, you see that person speaking about this business they created and the success they had, and you think to yourself, you know, I could do that. I, I could be this person, or I could be even more successful. Was that what was going through your head is, you know, you heard these stories? Well, the thing is, yeah, when you see, because you never hear, like when you read about it in the magazines, or it, you only hear about the, these huge successes, and when you read about it, they can really be glamorized to the point where it's like you're intimidated by these guys. You're intimidated by what it is, but when they sit there and talk to you for an hour, it's like, okay, this is just a real dude. Like, this guy just did this, and he just busted his ass, and there was a lot of hard work that went into it, and he had some huge success at the end of it. So it's like, yeah, it is inspiring. It does let you 
think that you can, that, like, anybody who's watching this thing right now, it's like, okay, you know, Jason, yeah, he's a normal dude. I can go ahead and do that. JR, he's a normal guy. I can go ahead and do that. It's like, I think by telling these stories and by sharing them, it is inspiring to other people to do it. Yeah, had I not gone through the entrepreneur program at USC, had I not seen all those stories, I would not be doing what I've what I've gone on to do. So, But it was really weird for me going from this entrepreneur program where it's like, yeah, you can do anything. And our professor at the time, he was very motivational, very encouraging for all that stuff. So you can go out and do anything you want. He had this kind of this life plan. It's like in your 20s, you're not going to have any success. So don't beat your head against the wall. Just take your time. Go learn something. Just chill. It was this lifestyle lecture that he gave. It was a fantastic lecture. And I'll summarize it. And it was during your 20s, just go and have fun and kind of learn some stuff. In your 30s, get yourself into an industry where you can actually learn some stuff and succeed. And it's not until you're in your 40s that you're really going to have most of your kind of financial, your wealth building success. Um, in our business now, in the so internet you beat space, him out. Well, beat them a little bit. Yeah, we beat them uh, beat a little. Yeah, <laughs> but it's kind of in our space, we've had that luxury where there's so many people that are so young that have had so much success. It's almost, it feels like that's the norm. But mm -hmm. I think it's because the internet space has been so new and it's given people opportunities to have a lot of success early on. And as the internet, as the internet businesses mature, I think it's going to be more and more difficult for people to have those early successes because they're just, it's, um, you know, the land grab, a lot of those, the, you know, right. the YouTube is, you know, there's not going to be another YouTube, or maybe, but there's not probably there's not going to be another YouTube um, in the next five years where guys were able to start it and get it up and running in 18 months and sell it for you know almost two billion dollars. So, yeah. all right. So uh, you you spend a year working at a hedge fund. You go to law school. Were you doing anything entrepreneurial going through law school? No, all I right. was. I was no. And then what kind of law did you practice, and how long did you practice for? It was uh, corporate securities law practice for 18 months. Okay. Yeah, so it was a short it was a short term, but just the transition from going from the, the entrepreneur program at USC to going into law school. It's like you can do everything. You can you can have the you know the world is your oyster. You can you can do anything you want. Then going to law school and it was such a, a juxtaposition of just like filling your head with all these ideas and then going into law school and saying like, okay, you can't do anything. And here's ten reasons why you can't do this stuff. You need to check every single box before you like get out of bed in the morning because if you don't, you're going to get sued. And this is it's like. Wow! Like what? It just, you spent three years reading cases of everything that could everything possibly that go wrong. wrong. Yeah. So, did you find the law training helpful? Because you know, I did my JD MBA, and often I'll get uh, folks asking me, you know, is that something that helped you a lot as an entrepreneur? And what I basically just tell people is, you make the most of whatever path you take. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by having an MBA or a law degree, you know, you definitely you can leverage it and it helps. But you certainly don't need it to start mm -hmm. a company. No, I don't think you need it all, and I think it's a deterrent in a lot of ways too. If you had to do it all over again, would you still get the? Well, I, I would do it just because of the the broad based learning that it teaches you and the different way to think about stuff. Um, because I never would have built virtual tours had I not gone to law school. I never would have built lunch had I not gone to law school. Because everything that we're doing through getting people online and contributing content, thoughtful content, getting people thinking critically, it's very similar to the training that you go through in law school. You know, kind of the Socratic method where you are forced to stand up in front of the class and, and articulate something. You may have read 100 pages of cases the night before, and you think you understand it. But until you're standing in a room full of 200 people, and you've got some guy grilling you about that case, and you have to articulate what you read the night before, that you understand it. and You have to formulate that thought and then express it. Or in some cases, what you read the five minutes before class. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> or, or not read at all, and then you really got to yeah. fake it. But, all right. it's out, but, but let me just finish on that point. But it's really, so that piece of learning, like taking that to what we're doing on lunch and what we, what we did on virtual tours, it's the same thing. It's like on lunch, if you're going to write a review about something, you're going to share an opinion about something. A lot of bloggers go through the same thing. It's like, you think you might have it in your head and you've got an idea and then you sit down to really articulate and explain it in written form, it's like, it's much harder. So it's like getting that, formulating that critical thought, but then being able to express it so other people can understand it. That process is very similar to the law school process and very similar to kind of changing the way we think about things and getting people thinking more critically about things and then getting them all the way to the point where they feel comfortable articulating that and sharing it. That's kind of a big progression and that's where when we see a lot of people coming online and contributing content you know whether it's in their blogs or whether it's across review sites like lunch it's that you get a lot of feedback from people saying how rewarding that is because you're really growing and developing as a person because you're able to express yourself and think about things and share them and they get feedback from other people that found it interesting it's like that's cool and so had I I probably wouldn't have come I wouldn't have come up with these ideas or or, or 
you know, this business had I not gone to law school. So law school was valuable for that. It was not valuable necessarily for all the other entrepreneurial type training that is necessary. You know what it takes, and yeah. I don't think most lawyers, you're taught that in law school, how to right. succeed as an entrepreneur. We got Lon here chomping at the bit to join law school. He's excited yeah, for his tarts and contracts. Yeah. No, actually, my, you know, my, I'm Jewish, so my mom, growing up, it was like brain surgeon or lawyer. Those yeah. are your two career options. That's, that's pretty much it. My family was like, can you be a doctor or a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It was I was like, like wow, that was helpful. All, all the bevy of options open to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's 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 just like passed and th passed on through your DNA. So yeah, right. It's just you know that's that's the and and my dad was a dentist and his dad was a dentist too. So there was a lot of that too. Yeah, dental, dental school always fall back. All right. So uh, you you spend eighteen months. You're practicing law. You're doing transactional law. You're writing contracts. Uh, where does the idea and impetus for virtual tourists come from? And can you talk a little bit about you know what virtual tourists did? Virtual tourists. It was a. Uh, it was a travel review site, basically. By the way, you're getting a call right now. Should I see who this is? Oh, boy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Somebody in a, a sombrero. So. Oh, that's me. That's me in the sombrero. Oh, that's you in the sombrero. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Um, oh, the, uh, called you. <laughs> who did? Uh, a a female. We'll, 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 we'll hide that. <laughs> um, the, uh, wait, what was the question? Exactly. Yeah. Right, now that we've sufficiently <laughs> distracted you, that's our strategy. Yeah. Uh, so what... You know, what was the impetus to starting Virtual Tourist? Okay, How did you yeah, make yeah. The transition, and then talk a little bit about you know what Virtual Tourist did and what it was all about. Um, just to kind of put it b before we lose anybody kind of tuning into this, Virtual Tourist was a uh, a review site for travel. Basically, we wanted to build a Lonely Planet guidebook, but written by tens of thousands of people. Um, we started it in '99. We grew the thing and we sold it to Expedia in 2008, um, and it was a great uh, a great sale. So. Um, but the idea, I met these, uh, when I was working at the law firm, they sent me over to Germany to go speak at this conference. And it was, it was a conference of startup companies. Um, so we, uh, we um, met, I met these two guys that, that were over there, and they had this website called VTourist. And I wanted to bring him as a client to the law firm. The partner didn't want that. He was only into bricks and mortar stuff. And I was kind of realizing that law wasn't going to be my career. I took this opportunity to move these guys over. I started Virtual Tourists with them. And we turned it from what it was into this user-generated content platform for, for travel. So you and, actually moved two people from Germany yeah. to the United States? Yeah. Where do they stay? I, well, they, uh, they stayed in my buddy Kenny's house for, for a while, and then we got them apartments. And uh -huh. that wasn't the hard part. Where they say the visas were the hard part of getting these guys over here and able to work. But yeah, we had an office right over here on 6th and Wilshire for a while until we, uh, yeah, until we went dead broke. And then we moved it into their apartment on 6th and California over here. So that, I mean, that must have been a pretty compelling sales pitch. I mean, if I just went to a different com country and tried to convince two people to move to the United States, well, you're giving, I'm not sure. You're giving me more credit. It wasn't that it, it, it wasn't that hard because at the time, this was 99, at the time there was so much going on in the U.S. There were so many things like oh, everybody, all these Got internet it. millionaires, like so you these guys were dying. The gold rush. He said, hey, it's like, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your ticket. Yeah, there follow me, follow me to the When you get off the plane, yeah. they're going to hand you stock to <laughs> yeah, startup exactly, companies. You're exactly. going to become instant millionaires. And yeah, within a year, they were sadly disappointed right. when we were dead broke. All and running it out of their apartment. Gotcha. Yeah. But Hans and Franz were in for the long haul. <laughs> they were they're ready for this, right? They uh, that's and so funny. they were the developers. They had developed yeah. a site so far. Yeah. And then you took the name V Tourist and turned it into Virtual Tourist. Virtual Tourist. Yeah. All right. That sounds a little bit less like sex involved, like <laughs> scummy. Like I like that better. Virtual <laughs> Tourist is better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, like, talk about. I mean, how did you? What was that experience like for you to now be, you know, an entrepreneur and a founder and running a company? I mean, how did, how did you adjust to that lifestyle? Well, the timing of it, this was late 99, and anybody that was doing this stuff back then, um, it was still kind of the go-go. It was at the end of the go-go internet time, and we were raising some money for some clients at the law firm, so I didn't think it'd be any problem. So I did a small friends and family round in November of 99, raised a couple hundred thousand dollars um, to move these guys over and for me to quit the law firm. So how much did you, did you disclose exactly how much you raised? 263000 was right. what we raised. And did raised. you put in some of your own money into that? I didn't have any money to okay. put in. So, so you were no. still paying off student loans, yeah, you know, living yeah. paycheck to paycheck, even as an attorney after a year and a half? Yeah, right. yeah. Because so, yeah, as okay. an attorney, yeah, you, you, uh, you get a nice lease on the car, you're on the fake it till you make it kind of program when, yeah. you're, when you're there. So yeah, no, there was, there and was that, no and money. That's a, let, let's talk about that for a second. So I think that's a trap that a lot of people fall in, which is, They'll go after a professional degree, like an MBA or a law degree or maybe become a doctor, and they'll say, I'm going to do something entrepreneurial later on. Mm -hmm. you know, I just want to get my footing down. 
but they'll build a lifestyle that requires a lot of cash flow. Mm -hmm. They'll get a mortgage, they'll get an expensive car, they'll get yeah. a trophy girlfriend or wife or trophy girl, uh, trophy boyfriend, you know, <laughs> and they have all these expenses and it's, it's very hard to walk away from that. And I think one of the reasons why sometimes young entrepreneurs do well yeah, is they already live a, a bohemian point. lifestyle that's a great point. and they don't have anything to lose or give up. That's, um, that's a great point. And you're right. That's, uh, I was in that. I, I never got to the point I didn't buy a house. I didn't do anything like that. I still don't own a house. You know, it's one of those things that's uh, like really keeping the, keeping, living modestly, keeping the means, um, living within your means is, uh, yeah, because once you get it up and you can't go back, like once you inflate your lifestyle, you can't go back to, to living cheap again. Yeah, it's really hard to. Yeah, yeah. So no, it was in, and in that point, I was living in my parent or my family's little 500 square foot shack in literally it's a little beach cottage in Manhattan Beach that they've had since the 20s and it's um I was living there for nothing and able to kind of take this risk and go start this company and it ended up being a huge it ended up being a huge risk because in 99 everything was happening um the internet bubble burst in March of 2000 so you know a few months after we started the thing that's when everything went to hell in a handbasket so with virtual tourists let's break down explain exactly yeah. what you're doing it was user generated content reviews yeah. of different locations yeah so things if to I do, wanted to hotels, go to Greece right. say this is the best place to go this is the best hotel to stay at on right this, this is what islands. you should be doing this is what yeah this is here's some off the beaten path stuff here's some packing list tips here's like everything that you'd find <laughs> in a guidebook if you were to buy a, a guidebook on Greece that's what that's what we want to do and for of, everything everything tourists right you did. right it was the idea like I, I traveled a lot and loved it and it's like every I think it's everybody's love when they're traveling it's like God can you imagine I'd be one of these writers that writes a guidebook like okay how so cool you're would that be? so you're a you're an ex-attorney, no real online entrepreneur experience. You haven't done anything online. You have no coding experience. Yeah. You have these two German yeah. fellows that are the coders. Yeah. I mean, what do you do to get the word out? I mean, I understand it's still earlier on the internet, but it's not like there, were, <laughs> there weren't any websites. I mean, how did you really get people adopting and, and how did you get that first set of users adopting and using virtual tourists? Well, one of the things that, that we're really fortunate with VTourist, the URL had been around since February of 94. So this was an extremely old URL, and back then Google was giving huge priority to, to the, the length of, that a URL was around. So as soon as we started putting some content up on there, it was getting indexed pretty well, and people were able to find it. So we were fortunate enough um, to have that. There was it was my two German partners. They bought this URL from some guy that worked at the University of Buffalo that set this up as a server list back in '94, to where you could click. There was a, a map where you could click on it to see all the servers around the world. So this is like an old school. So part of the, site. the part of the way is your value was in the deal. I mean, you, right. you, you got a good deal up front. Right. You right. We, with the URL, with yeah. that, we had some built-in. We, we knew that we were able to get some traffic as soon as we started putting some content so, up and on the And the, was there already a, you know, a, a built-in community of people that were contributing content to this already? There were, just because, you know, at the time, this was before the user-generated content didn't exist at, yeah. back then. And, in fact, a lot of people, they, they talked about, GeoCities was around. That was kind of what UGC was. Yeah. I don't know if you remember GeoCities. It's kind of, you know, where people would have little Green graphics parks. and everything uh, and with no real substance to it. Um, so when I'd go pitch this, like, venture capitalists and stuff and talk to them about what we were doing, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait. You want people to write the content? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's what, you know, it's great. It's like, I'd use this example of how when I was in India, the best, like, my best travel memory of all time was when we ran into this half drunk Kiwi in a hotel bar in Madras, India, and he tells us to scrap our trip to Agra to go to the Taj Mahal, like everybody does when you're in India, and to go to Darjeeling instead. So this random, this chance encounter where we meet this guy who just came from Darjeeling, and he says, no, 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 so we scrap the plan to go see the Taj Mahal, and we go up to Darjeeling instead. We fly through Calcutta, and then we drive all the way up in the mountains. It was beautiful. So you're in the foothills of the Himalayas, you know, drinking this Darjeeling tea. There's Sherpa training camps, and it's just like it, you can see Mount Kanchenjunga, the second highest mountain in the, in the Himalayas. It's like, it's unbelievable. So it's like I have this great travel memory that all leads back to this random chance encounter. So it's like when we're building out virtual tours, it's like, wow, how can we take that random chance encounter and, like, let everybody experience this and really find great information from people who really know about it. So, so we that could was, all meet half-drunk Kiwis. Th so we could all meet half-drunk Kiwis yeah. or full-drunk Kiwis, too. Yeah. Okay, so and do, was there any special marketing that you did? Were you, were you buying some traffic? Were, you, no. were there any all promotions SEO. you did? No, all SEO. We never spent a penny marketing virtual tourists. And was, so was, was the extent of what you raised at $208,000? Did you raise more money later on? No. 
No, wow. we never raised it. We couldn't raise any more money. Nobody would talk to us. People would look and say, "Why would they, they, why would I want to listen to what somebody else has so, to write?" So you raised two hundred eighty thousand dollars. Two hundred sixty-three. Two hundred sixty-three thousand dollars to that business, and I mean, it's it's been reported that had a very successful exit. I mean, it's been reported, you know, north of eighty million dollars that it, it sold for. I mean, that's quite an, an extraordinary situation to have raised that little capital and have that meaningful an exit. Um, yeah. It was a great exit. Yeah, it, it was. But there was a, that's there's ten years or nine years in between that that time when we raised that money and when we had the exit. And in there, that was um, that was a lot of uh, a lot of hard work. But had, had, do, do you? I mean, had you? If you had known how difficult it was going to be, would you have done it? No, yeah. no, not at all. Um, because there was like. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, then we couldn't raise any more money after the internet bubble burst. So, so let's, let's talk about that just for a second, because yeah. um, I know a lot of folks feel that you know they want to go ahead, that they want to go out and start businesses, and a lot of times they may feel that they don't have access to sophisticated angels or venture capitalists, and they feel like raising money from friends and family isn't an option. And that, that's a, it's a little difficult, right? It's a little difficult to go to the people you grew up with and your family. And ask them to make a bet on you. What was that process like for you of having to go to your family and say, "I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. I've found these two Germans that I'm flying out to Los, you know, to Southern California to hang out with us. We got this product, V Taurus. I mean, how was it that was, experience? It was, it was, it was much easier back then than it would be now. This was like '99 when everybody, everybody yeah. that put money in, into an internet deal at that time was making millions of dollars. So it wasn't that, it wasn't that hard. I'd like to give myself more credit and say it was yeah, really difficult, but it wasn't that hard. What was hard was when everything went south. And then I've got the friends and family that are all in it, and you feel all this responsibility, not only to the people that I had leave the law firm and leave the investment bank to come over and build out this team of people to you know, go build the site that we had to fire and tell them to go back to their jobs. But then we've got you know, these people that put money into our business that believed in us, too. That was. That was really tough. So a quarter of a million dollars is, is not a lot of capital. I mean, did you start making money in the business no. pretty quickly? How, no. did, how did you all support yourself? Um, unemployment. Wow. Yeah, we're on unemployment. We're, like I said, we're running out of the apartment. My, uh, my mom would bring down bagel dogs. from. She'd do a Costco run once a week and br drop off a bunch of stag chili and bagel dogs in the apartment. And, uh, and yeah, that's what, we, that's what we lived off of for, for a while through 2000. Um, kind of into 2001 as the business started growing and as we started figuring out how we could actually make money so at this. Wh why did you stick through it? I mean, you're, you're, you're a young guy in Southern California, you've got a law degree, you know, I'm sure you've got a lot of people whispering in your ear, hey, leave this thing alone, yeah, just go yeah. back to practicing law, you know, make a good living, you know, have your weekends to yourself, go surfing, you yeah. know, go out and hang out with some girls. Like, what was the... What gave you the motivation and desire to stick it through for that year and a half? It's, um, it was more than a year and a half, but it was, uh, it was, um, I don't know, it's like stubbornness, you know, there's like, you got that fight in you or something, like you don't want to just to quit and fail at something, it's like you just don't, um, I don't know, you know, there are a couple times I, I interviewed, I took some interviews at, at some law firms, I was going to go do some kind of, it came really close to going back and doing it just because when you're dead broke, you're doing, I did two sessions of unemployment where we're sitting there, you know, trying to get some cash to come in. I ran up my American Express bill and stiffed them like $25,000 one month. My, la my last thing before I bought, I knew I was going, we knew I was dead broke and so I go down to, down on Lincoln, there's that, uh, that water sports shop and I go down and I buy myself a kite surfing this whole setup. Spent two thousand dollars. It was the last thing, and then American Express cut me off like that afternoon. I, and I'm, I'm going to buy this kite surfing kit because I want to have something to do while we're going through this lean time while I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. That thing sat in my garage forever. I never used it because I was I was so depressed at this thing, this kite surfing kit that I was going to go out and have fun and keep myself entertained while I was dead broke. It was just it represented how mm -hmm. depressing it was, and it was a really rough time when we were going through that because you have this business you big hopes, it's failing, it's not working, you have no cash, and you're just scrapping for, you know, for anything and everything. So it's, did you, did, did your resolve surprise yourself? Were you surprised at, at how much determination and resolve you had? Because I don't know if you had faced something like that, yeah. you know, before. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it was, and it was, you know, the guys that, that stuck, stuck with it while we were doing this and, and building this out, too, they made a ton of sacrifices as well, and it was, um, 
Yeah, it was surprising. Yeah, because yeah, you don't know you have that in you really until you go through it. So, so that's great. Yeah. And so, t talk to me about you know when did things start to turn around and you know you start you know you have a little bit of wind at your back and things start going well. It was um, the nice part was people kept coming to the site and contributing content. And the traffic continued to grow, so it was working. We saw that we had little signs that it was working that people really liked the site and really liked what we were doing. Um, but there was no there was no ad. Revenue. There was a, the advertising at when the, after the bubble burst, ad adver, uh, internet advertising was the you know the third rail. Nobody wanted to get near it. And that so. was your plan for how you're going to monetize. Right, it. So. right. And so that was um, GoTo.com, um, the old Idea Lab company that became Overture, which ended up selling to Yahoo, which is Yahoo Search Marketing. They had their paid link system, so we finally convinced them to allow us to put their paid links into our content, which at the time nobody was doing. And it took me probably nine months to allow them to do this, uh, for them to allow us to do this. And that was a big turning point for us, because now we actually had some paid links that we could put in the site yeah. that we could start making, making money with. So early on, I, I think one of, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest traps for entrepreneurs when they first start out is the things you don't know that you don't know, right? I mean, there's all, the, the things you're prepared for, maybe you get mistakes, but what were the things that you had no idea of going in that were kind of the biggest challenges and pitfalls for you and hardest early on? Well, all of them, because I, I knew nothing about the internet business. I knew nothing about travel. I, I had, uh, travel's a very complex and complicated business with all the different suppliers and these GDSs and all these things. Like, I knew nothing. So it was, uh, those, I always tell people now, it's like, hey, if you want to start a business, go get a job in the industry that you want to be in and learn everything you can about it. Somebody's going to pay you to learn about the industry that then you can go start your business. I, I didn't do it that way, and it, it was. Is that how you end up in mail stripping? <laughs> yes, on the right track <laughs> on Saturdays. That was how I got down there. Yeah. Just, I was just curious. You start at the about. low level, and then you work your way. You become a featured dancer later. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but that was that was the big that was probably the biggest mistake that we uh, that I made early on was jumping into this. And like you said, would I have done it all again? Probably not. Like if I knew how tough it was going to be through there. So I, really, it wasn't a mistake. It was just. Your particular set of challenges. Yeah, well, it was yeah my ignorance that you know and the the hubris thinking that you can figure this stuff out and you can do it and everybody else is doing it. And I'm a smart guy. So I mean, where did the business eventually grow to? I mean, by the time you sold the company, you know, what were you doing in, in terms started, of traffic or we revenue? We started another little company along the way in 2004 called One Time, which was a booking comparison site, and it was all integrated within Virtual Tours. So Virtual Tours was all the content. We had One Time, which was the uh, Kind of more the e-commerce play on it, um, but we got it up to we were doing when we sold it we were doing about 18 million in revenue, and about 8 million of that was EBITDA. So we built this thing from nothing into a really profitable business. Yeah, gotcha. And so nine years, I mean that's that's really on the longer side of you know sticking with a company until it sells. I mean most internet companies, I'd say, I mean most internet companies you burn out probably in the first year, and then if they make it beyond that, typically have a life cycle of maybe you know, two to six years before there's some kind of liquidity event, you know, whether it's sold, goes public, mm -hmm. taken over by another company, you know, maybe just goes under at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, nine years is a, is a long time to run that business. Well, if we go all the way back, we started making money. As soon as we put those go-to ads on the page, we started making money. So we were able to grow this. We just grew this every year. The traffic continued to grow, hired more people. We grew this. I tell people we grew it like a small family business. How many folks were in the company by the time you sold it? Um, we had 50. It's a good size. Yeah. And so, I mean, uh, if growing at that pace, had you thought about raising additional capital? I we mean, didn't need it. We, we, once we got, we needed it when we were dead broke. But once we got through that point where we started making money and started growing, we didn't need it. We didn't need any cash. And I'm sure you were approached by lots of people to yeah. say they wanted to give you money and yeah. invest. And yeah. why did you? Why did you always turn down those options? I mean. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of what you were talking about before. When somebody starts a business, if you get your your lifestyle up too high. And then you can't scale it back. Like we were fortunate enough that our business lifestyle it was so dirt cheap. Like we were living on nothing. So it's like as soon as we started making a little money, it was great. It was something that we didn't have before. And, and when we were able to start paying ourselves some salaries, like wow, that's really cool. So it was uh, you know it allowed us just to grow incrementally that most people aren't able to do because most of the companies go out they raise some angel money they're gonna they're gonna spend that money knowing that they need to have another round you know in, in nine months or twelve months or whatever the case may be and that round's gonna last them for this long so most the way most internet business gets started now they don't have that luxury of lasting and making it work for nine years and it was only because of our 
very strange uh, beginning that we were able to kind of last it out and wait that, wait that long before we had an exit. And so one of the things I, I typically find is that um, you know, I often like to compare startups to you know, some startup founders to superheroes. And we're doing this event on Wednesday called mm -hmm. Startup uh, Entrepreneur Superheroes here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's going to be at the Milken Institute in Santa Monica. There'll be about 300 people there. If you're local, come on out. You can see the details at jasonazar.com. Uh, and I often find in you know, spending a lot of time with other CEOs and founders of tech companies that it's almost like they've got a, a special power, right? And so what would you say were the things that you're, what are the things that you're just best at, you know, that you do better than, you know, all your other skills, but also better than other people that you relied on to grow that business? Um. I don't know. I guess it's just it's a kind of that stubbornness, you know. It's that stubbornness and that, and just not wanting to. It, my business, it was just not wanting to give up and not wanting to move on to something else. It's, but it sounds like deal making was a skill you had that was pretty inherent. I mean, you were able to find these folks in Germany and convince them to come over here. Yeah. You said you spent nine months getting the deal done uh, for go to uh, go to. I mean, is, was that one of the things that helped you? Yeah, but that's just kind of that's you know. It's it, I, I guess so. I guess so. It's, so you're um, persistent. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Okay. And so, what were some of the other things that happened along the way? I know you and I had talked that what you had that when you sold that wasn't the first offer you got. I'm assuming you got a couple different offers along the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we almost sold the company. I think you're referring to we almost sold the yeah. company in 2005, and we were approached. We were we were always approached um, along the way because we were doing a lot of traffic and. We had a lot of great content, so people saw that and they knew that there was some money to be made in the travel space if you've got good content. So we were approached along the way uh, quite a bit, and yeah, we almost sold it in 2005. It was, and it was internet brands that made an offer, right? Yep. And then that actually turned into a suit, or yeah. there was a suit later involved. Well, we in didn't that. sell the company to them. We signed a term, and, and this yeah. is when we talk about like the lawyer background and and why I think it's a detriment in a lot of ways is because um, you know you're arrogant. You, you think you can handle all this stuff, and I got myself in a huge mess with internet brands because we signed a term sheet to sell the company to them in 2005. And um, internet brands, a large company, acquires lots of different internet companies. Yeah, yeah, and um, and in a term sheet, uh, term sheets are non-binding, with the exception of one one part basically, which is the breakup fee. If you decide not to do the deal or the no shop agreement and the breakup fee that's attached to it, so basically you sign a term sheet to sell to somebody, you agree not to talk to somebody else for three months, let's say, so that they can negotiate with you to get a final deal done. And if you end up selling it to somebody else, and you have to pay them a certain breakup fee, and that's um, not standard in every term sheet, but it can be part of a term sheet. It can be, yeah. yeah. And it was in this case, and there was a breakup fee in it. And when we decided not to sell it to them, they came after us for the breakup fee. Sued us. The lawsuit went on for two years. Uh, cost, you know, over a half a million dollar in legal fees to to defend the thing, and it was a huge pain in the ass. And ultimately, um, we won. We were won 100 percent. There was completely in our favor, but it was just a, a big pain in the ass. And it was all because I got myself into that problem because um, I didn't have a lawyer when I had when I negotiated that term sheet. And this was there was one little piece in there that shouldn't have been in there that I kind of missed that um, gave them the uh, gave them the chance to sue us, and they and they did. And so if uh, if there's any advice that I could give, it's like. Yeah. It's uh, get a good lawyer and get somebody to be on your side that's going to help you out because I didn't have one at that point. I really got my and I got myself in a lot of trouble. So going through virtual tours, any other major lessons you learned that, you know, if if uh, if a uh, you know a young entrepreneur came to you and said, "Hey, I'm thinking of starting this business," what were the big lessons you've learned so far? What from the virtual tourist experience would you share with them? Well, it's, it's kind of what you mentioned earlier, too, of taking whatever your projections are for sales, cut them in a half or a third. I think that's a, that, that's a good piece of advice. And whatever the time frame is on that, from my experience, it's like these things take a while. Like, I, I, don't, I would never go start a business saying that you're going to be out of it in two years or out of it in a year. You know, the, the YouTubes of the world where the guys sell it within 18 months for billions of dollars, it's like that just doesn't happen. That's not... That's not normal in my experience. Like my experience is, you're in it and you're busting your ass, you're working your ass off for multiple years to the point where 
um, you're either making money and you can have the great sustaining business or you might be fortunate enough to find somebody to actually acquire the thing. So it's um, the time frame. I think a lot of people, and a lot of people burn out on these things too early because their expectation when they get into it is that they can exit, they can get out of there in a couple of years. And that's just, I think that's unrealistic. It's just so few, few, so few people actually have that type of success. Yeah. All right, so um, it was a year and a half ago that you sold Virtual Taurus. Two years ago now. Two years ago. Yeah. And you didn't wait long to get back in the game. So just to start off, I mean, why not take some time, travel the world, hang out? I mean, you did very well. I mean, to, to sell the company for that amount and to have raised the amount that you did, I mean, you must have done very well on the deal. Yeah. I mean, you got a big chunk of that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so... You know, what was the motivation to start another company right away? Well, part of the reason that we sold Virtual Tours was because I wanted to go start this other company. So it was all kind of... I mean, if you didn't have to, you'd never have to work for the rest of your life, right? I mean, if you just wanted to say, hey, I'm, I'm retired, and how old are you now? 39. 39. I'm, I'm retired at 39. I don't have to work. I mean, you could do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, where... So first it was... Yeah, the... I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> what did I Why am I doing this? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what was the motivation to say, hey, I'm going to jump right back in the game and do this all over again? Um, well, part of it... Well, uh, this was an idea. This was a concept. That, lunch is a concept that we've had for a while. We used to call it Infomunity. I owned the URL Infomunity back in like 2001. And, and lunch has nothing to do with you know, food. Or nothing to do with like food. It's, it's this idea of... Uh, uh, Infomunity was these, this idea of these information-based communities where people could create basically what we did with virtual tourists, but create it for anything and everything. So if you're into baby strollers or you're into vegan food or you're into this, you can create a, a really rich community where people are thinking critically about the content that they're contributing. Because I saw how valuable it was and how great it was on virtual tourists of all these people coming together, sharing all of this great content and how it changed so many people's lives for the better. So, so it's, it's, it's really a community of people sharing their interests, advice, um, feedback on virtually any topic. Any topic, okay. yeah, any topic. And we allow the people to form communities where they can then take these topics that relate to whatever their passion is, put them together in a community, and really dig deeper into this. Um, so basically think of it like you can create your own tr uh, trip advisor, you could create your own mini Yelp, you could create your own mm -hmm. virtual tourist for whatever it is that you're passionate about. And it's, um, it's like a group functionality on steroids because you've got the review, all the review functionality, the quick tips, you can create lists. We built, it's so feature rich in there, and the ability to communicate with everybody within the community, it's unlike anything that. Why, why lunch.com? I mean, you didn't, you've obviously bought that domain. Yeah. Yeah. Just any, any meaning to the domain name? Um, no. It's, I, I, it's just a great word. So give me it's, your phone, let me borrow your phone. It's a great, uh. So we got the little lunch logo right here. Yeah. We've got it actually up on the laptop too, so people oh, can good. take a look. I'm yeah, nice. but this is much cooler. I mean. That is, that is cool. Oh yeah, so you've got the book community up there yeah, right now. So that's somebody some just set up this. Somebody set up this book community. There's a thousand members now in this book community. Of these are all book lovers that are in there talking about all this stuff. And it's, um, you know, it's one of the. We've got 500 communities on the site so far that people have up and running. And it's, uh, this is, uh, it's, it's really, it's going, it's working. Um, but so anyways, we sold virtual tours, and the reason it was so that we could go ahead and start launch, we could do this. And it was part like, I felt like we had an obligation to do it a little bit because there weren't many people that had that much experience in building user-generated content review sites like we had. And just there's so much good that comes out of it. You know, and you've been self-financing this company, right? I mean, yeah. there must have been lots of people that offer to give you, I mean, once you sell a company, especially for the amount that you did, yeah. you, you, know, you have everyone trying to give you their money for your next deal. Um, yeah, yeah, there, there were a few people, but yeah, we, we didn't raise anything, we didn't take any, we didn't take any cash. They're still kind of approaching us, and we actually might, I'm at the point now where we, we, uh, we've got some large expansion stuff that we're getting ready to roll out, so I might start returning some of those calls with some of those guys, because we might be, might be doing around at some okay. point here. So what's, uh, what's different the second time around? I mean, how do you, how do you approach being a CEO and a founder differently the second time than you did the first time? Um, well, you know a little bit more, so it's, and this one wasn't, you know, we weren't running this out of the apartment. I took, when we sold Virtual Tourist, I took 17 people out of Virtual Tourist and put them into lunch. So that was a very complex deal to carve out kind of everybody that, and, and start up this new business with them. So we were so up really and had running. the same family, the same team. Same team. We'd worked together for a That's while. Great. So yeah, it was, uh, it was great. But the part where it's different is now we've got you're going in day one with a burn rate of you know substantially more than we yeah. ever burned when we were with virtual tourists. But yeah. so we're going for just something much larger, much bigger than what we ever had with with VT. So, and so uh, what's your uh, 
how would people describe you? I mean, what's your rep as a manager, as a CEO? How do, how do your employees, you know, what's the lens in which they see you, and how would they describe you as a boss? Um. Because I've always seen you as a little bit more a social laid back situation, and I, and I said that, and then you made a comment to me one time that not everyone sees you that way in the office. Do you, do you feel like you're different and very different in your social life than you are in your professional life? Um, yeah, in, in, in certain situations, but I, I think my style, it, it is more laid back. I'm not, I'm not a micromanager by any means. Um, I'm not good at that. It's kind of more. I feel like I give people a lot of autonomy to do whatever, to get the job done however they see fit. Um, but also, I like to enjoy it. Like, that's the other thing I tell people. It's like, I don't want to come in, I don't want to be the hard ass in the office. Like, if somebody's screwing up, like, if you're not doing a good job or you don't want to be here, if you don't want to be working with me, if you don't want to be in the office doing this job, like, I don't want you here. Because then it sucks for me because I'm, like you said, I, I, I could be off traveling the world or doing whatever, but I, I'm doing this because I enjoy it and I want to be doing it. So if I'm surrounded by people that are pissed or they're not completely stoked to be there and working with us, it's like that creates a bad situation for me. So um, I try to attract people that want to work in that environment and that want to be there um, because they enjoy they enjoy being there and they enjoy the work that they're doing. They enjoy being productive. That's the main thing that I look for when I'm, I'm trying to find somebody to... Uh, to work with. So let's say someone's trying to break into the tech industry and they want to work for you, okay? Maybe junior level, mid-level. What are the characteristics that you value most? I mean, what are the things that you want to see in that person that mean the most to you as their employer? Smart and hustle. That's it. They just got to, like, you don't, it, I don't think that you need to have a ton of experience for a lot of the entry-level stuff that, that we'd be hiring for, but as long as you're smart and you want to learn and, and you hustle and you um, you understand what it's what it's like working at a startup. There's no you know this isn't a big company where it's like hey you kick something to the other department to get it done. Mm -hmm. It's like we need something done. If it includes you know going down and buying a new copy maker. You're going down and buying a new copy. Like I don't care what it is. Like everybody's got to pitch in and do that stuff. And it really comes down to there's certain people that just really enjoy being productive, and they really enjoy producing and feeling, and that gives them fulfillment. And that's the type of person that. You know, you, you want to attract, not the the, the person that the, when the five o'clock whistle blows, they're like, oh God, I can't wait to get out of here. Thank God the weekend's here. I'm out. You know, see you guys. It's we want the people around that are like excited about the work that they're doing and enjoy creating something that hasn't existed before and being part of building something that's um, going to affect millions of people's lives. And that's cool. And that's and and it really enjoys it and it's fun. And so lunch is based down here in Southern California, but a little bit off the beaten path, right in El Segundo. Yeah. All right, so it's not the, off the beaten path for you Santa Monica well, guys, but it's like, no, there's a lot of stuff down there. Way in, out. Yeah, the there's, 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 like, there's a lot Segundo. of stuff down in, uh, yeah, no, we're 20 minutes away. It's, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there, El Segundo, there's a lot going on down there. Yeah, r relative to El Segundo. <laughs> <laughs> relative to Hermosa relative, Beach. Relative yeah. to Barstow yeah. and Fresno, there's a yeah, lot going true. on. Compared to Barstow, it's God. a beehive of it. It's like I get attitude yeah. from the guys up north. I can't believe I'm getting the attitude from the Santa Monica <laughs> guys now. It's unbelievable. Well, we just want you closer by. We want you hanging out so you can more easily hang out. I'm not us. hanging out. I was. Uh, we were up here before, I told you, 6th in California in some dingy old apartment. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Uh, I'm not coming back up here. So what are, what are the big plans, things you've got going on at lunch, new launches? You recently launched, had a big launch around, you know, a, a new type of groups and communities feature. And yep. It seemed like that did really well. Yep. Yeah, we launched communities a few months back. And like I said, it's going great so far. We've got some of these communities are really taking off and really kind of defining. We're finding this new... Um, we're calling them founders, these people that create the communities. It's really a new web persona. You know, you've got kind of your blogger, you've got your person that writes reviews, you know, across different sites. Um, you've got a lot of people, and 99% of the people just consume content. They're really not giving anything back. But so of the people that are actually contributing the content, we're kind of identifying this new founder uh, mentality. And this is something that, you know, might have a blog, might write some reviews on sites, but more is really good at kind of organizing people and bringing people together around a certain topic. And it's interesting kind of watching these people surface and build these communities and really manage them and moderate them and market them and get new people into them. It's like, it's really cool. So that was, um, and it's harder than I thought too. I, I, I thought that these founders were going to be easier to find. Mm -hmm. That's been one of the challenges that we've had is like getting more good founders in to build these communities. So, um, have you found that things have changed in the last nine no. years? Just the proliferation of no. websites, it's, it's like, harder to get people's mind share to do something? Completely. It's, uh, this is much, much harder to, um, much harder to get traffic. 
much harder to get exposure, much harder to get people to pay attention to it. I, I, Facebook has been such like a, an attention vortex for people, where it's mm -hmm. like it's just sucking everybody in, and it's hard to get people out of that um, out of that mindset. And that's been one of the that's that, that has been one of the challenges that we're that we're facing that we're we're uh, we're still dealing with. And the space has changed too because you know when we started this the. The motivation for people to contribute content, there are two, two main things that we saw. It was like recognition, obviously. Everybody knows that if you recognize for your contribution, um, then you're going to contribute more, and that feels good to get some feedback and things so like that. So with badges on Foursquare, you get badges. On, well, that's this whole, in, yeah. so on the recognition side of it, yeah, there's this whole new social gaming thing that's, that's in place. So we've built out a really comprehensive badging mechanism now where a community founder, so if you have your books community, for example, the books community that we're looking at, mm -hmm. you can go in as the founder. Adriana is the founder of that community, and she can go in and set up her own badges where she can now, if you want to have a, uh, the Pride and Prejudice badge for, you know, if you review three Jane Austen books or something, you can earn this badge, and so creating, giving them these new tools that didn't exist before, kind of putting in some recognition and some social gaming to really make it fun to give people to recognize them for their contributions in new, really personalized individual ways. That's great. Yeah, so that's been cool. So we actually well, had a question from the chat room. They want to know how much you paid for Lunch.com. If you're willing to reveal that information, um, I'm not willing to reveal it. That's well, it. fair enough. Yeah, that's a. Uh, That'll show them. You know, it was. Uh, that's a good question, though. It's a very common question, and it was. Um, it was. Uh, it was the most money I've ever spent on anything. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Well, you're recently engaged, so is it more than your? It was more than the diamond ring. <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. Um, God, that is a bad question. <laughs> um, Let's say they were in the same ballpark. I don't need to get you in trouble here. Okay. Yeah, Maybe well, you should so, give her the domain name instead of the diamond ring. <laughs> Just transfer over the domain <laughs> name. By the way, amazing, beautiful, smart, talented fiance who we've got a chance to hang out with. You're, you're a very lucky guy. Can we pull up a picture of her in no, maybe a swimsuit no, or something? On, is that, give me a name. Is that available? No, no, Can we that's... find her Facebook photo? Um, yeah, we don't need to. Okay. She, 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 uh, hey, thank Susan. you for all that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Susan. Um, no, but she's, uh, thank you. And we're really excited. Yeah. That's great. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, all right. So the next big challenge, I mean, what, el what else do you see ahead of yourself? I mean, continuing to build out lunch. Are there, are there big goals you have? I mean, do you see yourself building companies for the rest of your life? Is there, you know, or do you want to do something Bono style now where you go help save a country? Do you want to go into politics? What do you see as the next big thing for you? Um, I'm so focused on this right now. I, I don't know what the next piece is, but it would, um, yeah, no, there, there's definitely the, the philanthropic aspect of um, having been fortunate enough to have some success. It's like that's, that would be the next, that's what I'd be doing right now. If I probably wouldn't be traveling the world. I would probably be doing something uh, more cause-based. Um, but I felt like what, I'm, like I said, the opportunity of what we have to build right now with lunch is so significant and it can affect so many people's lives in such a positive way that I really want to see this through. And then after that, um, I don't know, you know, probably, uh, yeah, maybe something a little more philanthropic probably. Okay. So really anyone that's got an interest in building out a community online, that they've got a hobby yeah. or a special interest, um, can go to lunch. They can set up a community or become part of the community, join the discussion, build out valuable resources, uh, and just take part in it that way. Anybody, yeah, anybody that has any passion about anything. If you're writing reviews, if you have your own blog, you should come check it out because. So if you're somebody that has no passion about nothing, <laughs> stay away from stay away. We're not stay the place away. for yeah, you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's your in your tagline. No passion, not for us. No passion about anything. Yeah. We got nothing for you, kid. Yep. That's you're right. That's it. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, I think we have a segment. Do some news. Going to the news, and so. Nice. Uh, pretty badass picture you got That's, there. Yeah, Lana. exactly. I like Normally, it. I would be entering the studio, so it would be a big. Uh, what was that one movie intro. where Tom Hanks played that enforcer? Remember, it was a little out of place. It was hard for me to picture Road Tom to Hanks. Road to Perdition. Yeah, that Road to Perdition. Yeah. That, I kind of feel like you know that's you. Like you're gonna take a bullet for your kid. Sure, I, a little bit more like Jude Law in Road to Perdition, actually, <laughs> with the crazy teeth. 
I'll, ta I'll take it. I'll take the compliment. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no, 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 I'm much more of a Jude Law kind I'm of guy. I'm more of a Jude Law. <laughs> well, because he, he's playing ugly in that movie. That's the oh, whole okay, point. Remember, he's you. like the freakish guy who no, kills people. Yeah. No, I know. I often compare myself to Brad Pitt. and. Yeah. Well, when he's dressed down a little. Yeah, when he's dressed down. Yeah, yeah. True well, romance. 12 Monkeys. True, true like romance, a, Brad Pitt. Yeah, we're like <laughs> dressed down Brad Pitt. Right. Yeah, that's, I think that's fair. They are, maybe, but... You and I, maybe, you're like, well, who's a Jewish star that we compare? Like, we're like dressed down Billy Crystal. <laughs> William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the only first Jewish star that occurred to me. All right, let's jump on. To the let's, news. let's get into the news. Uh, so, uh, rumors abound about the next version of Apple's set top box, the Apple TV. In Gadget reported earlier this year, it's going to run on iOS, the same operating system as the iPad I've got here on the iPhone. Uh, but now there's a lot more gossip coming out. Uh, in addition to streaming content directly from the cloud, unlike how iTunes currently does it with, uh, you know, you download the content and then you play it, uh, it's also rumored Apple's going to push 99 cent streaming TV rentals. So, it'll work just like when you rent stuff on uh, iTunes now. Now, where you get, uh, you know, it comes in for 30 days, and then once you push play, you've got 24 hours to watch it as many times as you want. Um, so, do we think that uh, viewers are going to prefer the 99 cent rental model that Apple's now working on instead of Hulu Plus, which is offering, you know, 10 bucks for all you can watch, or Netflix, which is also a subscription model? And are we reaching a point where Americans are finally going to get weaned off of like pay for cable, and then that's how you watch TV? You have your Comcast subscription. Like, is it eventually going to move to this new model? What do you think, JR? Well, we had, it's funny. We just had one guy on lunch actually write a review where he gave up DirecTV for six months. Mm -hmm. And he was only using all the online stuff to oh, watch yeah, I everything. I saw that community. And he, um, but he had to go back. He had to go because he couldn't get all the sports. It's just not there yet to finally get off of, get off of cable and get off of everything that's, that's there. So he well, had to. Sports seems to be the one thing that nobody yeah. can get enough capital to pay, like the NBA, to let him stream every uh, basketball game. Yeah, whatever. and I'm not sure even with, as, uh, you know, I don't know the technology behind it, but the, uh, to be able to stream it in high def, because you've got to watch sports in high def now. It's the only right, way you can yeah. see it. So if they can do that, I think at the point they could do that, that we can... Yeah, we could get off of it, but not not yet. Well, what's interesting about Hulu is that Hulu launched their subscription service, but they still have advertising. Mm -hmm. Their subscription service doesn't even get rid of the advertising, just gives you access to yeah. more content. And their CEO actually said the other day, yeah. this was not good PR, but he said, like, well, we'd consider an even more expensive package where you don't have advertising. Yeah. It's like, you need to settle on yeah, a price. Yeah, it was, it was a good spin. I think he said something like, you know, where our users found that they don't mind advertising, they actually like it in some instances. And yeah. so... I don't know. I mean, I've uh, definitely since I got the iPad, I've been buying a lot more content and watching it on there. Uh, and I think people will do it, but it, it, it gets expensive. I mean, it does. You see your bill at the end of the month, and it's it's not the most cost efficient way to consume like television or vi or videos. Yeah. And the thing that I'm often surprised at is that the prices haven't been driven down. I mean, I'll go to like a, a rental of a movie can cost four ninety five or five ninety five. I mean, that's pretty much what it cost a year ago. If you went to just get it at Blockbuster, and that's when yeah. they had lots of people and stores. And so, what I'm not seeing is, you know, the distribution of digital content really driving down the cost of consumption. I think when that happens, you know, a lot more people will start using it. But to pay, you know, two dollars to four dollars to watch a show is still pretty expensive. Yeah, no, it, it, especially like one episode of a TV show yeah. for a buck when you're, you know, paying cable once a month and then it just all kind of comes And there's just certain things in the industry that don't make sense. I mean, they're charging $4 for that, but it's the same piece of content. If your friend tivo you can just go to their house and watch and, and stays on the TiVo indefinitely. Yeah. So there, there's a little bit of that weird dichotomy where someone's asking you to pay for something that you could almost just as easily get for free. Well, and, I don't and think... with, you know, illegal piracy, you can yeah. get all of it for free, which is still kind of the elephant in the room, I think, yeah, for all absolutely. this stuff. So I don't I don't know I mean I I probably take a wait and see approach towards yeah well and there's Google on. TVs coming too I mean everybody's sort of trying to get into this new you know get people the content that they want immediately streaming in the cloud it just seems like nobody's kind of perfectly threaded the needle yet yeah. So the next story, uh, according to a blog post on the startup site, Facebook is acquiring social travel recommendation service Next Stop. Uh, Next Stop launched in 2009. It combined a travel search engine with a recommendation and a reputation system. Uh, they almost were comparing it to like a social game based on popular travel destinations. It was launched in early 2009 by former Google employees Carl, I'm going to mispronounce this guy's name, Shogreen, S-J-O-G-R-E-E-N, Shogreen, it's something Scandinavian, and Adrian Graham, who had been part 
part of the teams behind Google Calendar and Picasa. Uh, so most of Next Step's employees and assets are going to go to Facebook, uh, and the site's going to release all of its current recommendations, all their content under a Creative Commons license. So uh, a lot of people were theorizing on TechBlogs this was a talent acquisition. Facebook just wanted some Google product people to come in, especially people who had some social background. Um, do you think this is actually an indication that Facebook is going to try to socialize travel and get into travel search? Well, well travel's getting hot again. I mean, Google just did an acquisition for, I think it was $700 million yeah. to buy access to travel logs and data. Yeah, I mean, it was a TTAA. Or yeah. Something, one of those so, me, your old space is, is getting real hot again. Yeah. You know, um, what, what do you make of the acquisition? Well, yeah, the Google one, it was ITA. ITA. I, ITA software. And they're. They've been around. They've been around. You know, you talk about a, a ten-year overnight success. Those guys. I remember back in 2000, we both won some award at some travel virtual tours, and ITA Software won like some innovation awards because we we're doing different. They were doing cool stuff on the software side, and we were doing stuff on the on the content side. But they're more on the booking side of things, where they're actually yeah. processing a lot of the the tickets being sold. And it's all the the data. They're actually uh, ITA supplying the data to pretty much every like Everybody. kayak yeah. and Bing Travel, and all, they're they're just pulling their data from ITA. So it's interesting when all their contracts come up, and are, are, is Google going to sell travel data to Bing? I mean, mm -hmm. is that how it's going to go? It's um, yeah, that was a big one. ITA, it's, it's, that's been one of the the names in travel that's been in play for a while. Everybody's been talking mm. about wanting to get a hold of ITA and, yeah. and, and what it was going to go for. And, and Google had a bid for seven hundred million on the table for a while. I think they were trying to shop for a higher bid, and eventually just came back to Google. To be honest, I thought it was I, when I saw it, it sounded low when uh, mm. when the seven because people were talking about that being a billion dollar deal at some point. So. It, um, I thought that it would have gone for more when it went. But so they've, they've what do you think Facebook them. should be doing in the travel space? Um, that's a uh, well, not just in travel, but just on the on the content side of things. It's really interesting what Facebook is right now and where they're going. And um, I'm not, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've, I've spent I've been up talking to them about it. I've spent a lot of time. Um, Trying to figure out exactly where they're going to be on the content side of things, but I don't think this next stop acquisition it has anything to do with the with the travel content. Just because um, it's been really weird, and I'm upset that I didn't spend more time on next stop before they shut it down. Now you can't even get on the site. Yeah, now there's no more to, new users, and September 1st it's going offline completely. So you can't even go in there. See, in fact, I wrote the next stop guys yesterday when I read the news, and I said, hey, I'd love to because they've set up a Google group for all the people that were on their site. Um, if they're watching this, I'd love to set up a lunch community for all of your users, and that's what I wrote them yesterday because it could be a nice way for them because it looks like if they're just shutting it down and they're they're taking all of their users' content and just putting it out under this Creative Commons yeah, license. Yeah, they're make it so it's, easily distributable. Right, so it, it's a little, I've never seen anybody do this with a user-generated content site before, where you've got all these users, you've got all this content, and then just go ahead and shut it down, and they're going to be, it was an asset purchase from what I read, they didn't purchase mm -hmm. all the assets, they just purchased some of them, so that's why it does sound more like a, a talent acquisition, but it mm -hmm. probably does signal that they are getting more into the content business yeah. at some point. I think it's interesting overall just that Facebook's getting so much more active with trying to pick up assets and teams and acquisitions. I think yeah. it says a lot about their headspace. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next story. Uh, this one I, I thought was, was sort of fascinating. World of Warcraft developers Blizzard have touched off a massive controversy, announcing their intention to force people to post to message boards and forums using their real names. Uh, and no usernames or anything. You have to use your real first and last name. Uh, the change is going to take effect starting with the forthcoming release of the long-awaited StarCraft II, uh, and it will eventually apply to World of Warcraft in a few months once they release their new expansion pack, Cataclysm. Uh, Blizzard's, Blizzard's saying they're moving to the new system because they don't want to have to moderate so much. Um, Blizzard fans are arguing in all sorts of reasons that this is an invasion of privacy or a bad policy. Uh, a, a lot of gamers are worried about threats from stalkers, threats of violence from people who don't like what they have to say about World of Warcraft. Uh, and people are also posting, you know, it's going to cause negative impact at the workplace, like their boss will see you were posting at 4 a.m. last night about uh, your guild or whatever. So do you think the fans have a point here? I mean, is it it's sort of up to Blizzard to decide if they want people to have to use their real names? Or is know. there genuinely a privacy issue here? I think this sounds like a horrible idea to me, because I'm not, and I'm a I'm a self affirming geek. I watched you know Star Trek growing up, and I had like the models and all the things. I never quite got into guilds and Warcraft, but the whole thing going on here is you know people create this alternate world for themselves and yeah. identities and their cloaks and daggers <laughs> and 
to make, you know, to try to combine real life with that sounds like a recipe for disaster. And I think you're just going to have a lot of, like, schizophrenia going on. Like, the number of people going to psychologists are going to go up because <laughs> I don't think people want to combine their World of Warcraft world yeah, with their real life world. Yeah, they pretty insistent that these should, the worlds are colliding. I mean, imagine if George you Cassandra had to combine saying. your male stripping with what you do here at this weekend. <laughs> yeah, just, right. The I mean, two worlds I'm stardust there, and it's collide. a whole separate identity. See, exactly. I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent in online accountability. I think we all should be using our real name. I think it would help with a lot of things that, that we do. Um, but this is a game. Like yeah. this is, and it's a fantasy game, right? It's fan. It's yeah, it's a, it's a role right, and game, it's a right? really intense. I mean, you really yeah, get so sucked like, into the world. And... In general, like on lunch, other sites we're out there. I, I, I'm a big proponent. I've written about how you know we're shifting away from anonymity and more towards accountability when it comes to online. A lot of online contribution, but. That's all in, in the real stuff. When you're talking about a fantasy game like this, it seems strange that they're going to be forcing I, I, I people to use I just think that if, if, if you get magic potions and spells and kill <laughs> trolls and demons, having your first name on there isn't, you know, yeah. the most important thing that you've got to do. I mean, you know. People yeah. are saying in the chat room that they've actually canceled this idea today. So I didn't, I didn't see the update this morning. I, I may I, have... I, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen. People are actually going to change their real names <laughs> to, to their to their <laughs> online the name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like... Griffith Warrior 84. <laughs> I mean, that's you just refer to me as that, boss. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody comes in a lunch and, like, you'll now need to refer to me as, you yeah. know, Great. Odin the Great. <laughs> it's just going to happen, so get used to it. And one of your employees is invariably going to switch over. Great. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Great. I mean, there was suggestion, too, that Blizzard may have been, like, floating this to see what kind of reaction it would get and never really planned to go through with it. So I, I believe that they canceled that today. But that, that would be amazing. Like, it was only a few days ago, and the outcry, people were so upset that they, how dare you, you know, make me use my real name in this game. And then not even the game, in the forums about the game. Yeah. Pretty grab. All right, uh, we'll, we'll do, we'll do uh, there, there was one story we wanted to talk about, uh, that we were talking about out there, but I'll, I'll go one more uh, that I had prepared. Uh, MapQuest, uh, the number two mapping service behind Google Maps, has announced that it will launch a new site based on the project OpenStreetMap, which is big in Europe, uh, and it crowdsources user-generated maps. Uh, almost like Wikipedia, but for your local neighborhood. So the project is going to launch just in the UK, but you can log in from anywhere and make stuff about your neighborhood, and they're going to put a million dollars into the US version um, AOL is going to, which owns MapQuest. Uh, so for now, MapQuest is going to continue to rely on their purchase maps, but they're hoping, and they're saying one day, uh, they're going to shift to maps that are user generated. And obviously, you know, there are some advantages to having users do it, which is it could be really detail oriented about your community. So you could update it when there's traffic or construction or even for little niche kind of topics like are there wheelchair ramps at these places. Um, so we've seen that the public's going to update sites like Wikipedia for free, uh, even though there's been you know, questionable veracity. Uh, do you think this is eventually going to apply for maps? Do you think uh, it, this could make MapQuest more competitive with Google Maps if it was like the public was designing it? So I'll raise my hand. I, I'm super cynical of this. I mean, if I'm, I'm not going to trust somebody user-generated map. <laughs> You're right. I've got an, I've, you know, you can talk all you want about, you know, there being negative things of Google and large internet companies, but Google's got satellites. And yeah. even then they miss maps up sometimes yeah Do and we, i'm off on a wrong way i don't want to be trusting some random <laughs> some some yeah, hi guys. guys hey i think this is how you get here dude to get to my location i mean yeah. i'll take the satellite and google thank you very much over user generated content map i'll let you go on your adventure trail of mysticism didn't Google try this a couple years ago Didn't google they? does they've had a sort of a side project of a user generated map uh, for a while and uh, i think in some countries where uh, either the satellite start th th where they don't have as a robust a service. I think they actually do let people sort of fill in their neighborhoods or whatever. Um, but yeah, this is actually. I mean, they're they're talking about trying it out and then maybe even shifting it over to the main MapQuest product. Which by the way, not how much doing. time do you have to have on your hand to create a user generated content map? I mean, <laughs> look, I get going on and talking about like your interests. Yeah. But I mean, what? How hey, long you never have you know, been though. You never know that you're gonna map out the directions from you know Santa Monica to, to El Segundo? <laughs> I mean, if, if you were critical ways. mass, you had like thousands of people doing it. and They were all just doing their street or their block yeah. or something. It's like I could how see many amateur working, cartographers are there out there? They're there really dying to go make people. these maps. I don't know, but then you know people would have said the same thing about it, an encyclopedia. But is, isn't that actually like? Isn't that? I mean. That's how we found America. They made the wrong map. <laughs> Isn't that how we ended yeah. up here, right? Some guy was like, oh, I've got a great map for you to get to the, the land. Yeah. It's India, spices. Yeah, Christopher and Columbus's user-generated map. I mean, those, were, yeah. I mean, those were user-generated content maps. And yeah. Then, you know, 
It does seem <laughs> I'm not like sure I want to go set. back to there. Well, it's also the, the margin of error. I mean, if you're on Wikipedia and it's like it has the wrong year that so and so Marco Polo was born, yeah, it's like, look, oh, well, you got the wrong year. Drive you to, but yeah, you're not lost. Jay and, our, the Jay and I both run user generated content <laughs> businesses. We're two of the biggest proponents of it, but even I have, you know, <laughs> my you're not going that far. I'm going to draw, yeah. It's like, what next? User generated, like, Drug prescriptions or something? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh, I like that. I mean, WebMD <laughs> should uh, adopt this model, user-generated diagnoses. Uh, so the last thing we'll talk about, we were talking about this uh, out front. It, it's obviously, it's not really tech news, but it's the, it's the biggest news uh, in the world, or in America today at least, uh, which is LeBron James finally settling to go to the Miami Heat after a long-winded decision-making process. Will he go to the Knicks? Will he stay in Cleveland? Uh, and so we can go to my screen. Uh, Dan Gilbert, the majority owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, wrote this really uh, really emotional, like angry letter, open letter to uh, the citizens of Cleveland uh, saying LeBron James deserted them. And uh, it was unlike uh, anything witnessed in the history of sports, and it was bitterly disappointing. And my favorite part, he personally guarantees that the Cleveland Cavaliers will win an NBA championship before LeBron James wins one with the Heat. Gotcha. So my first thing, my first question is, this seems remarkably similar to a lot of Jason Calacanis's letters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if he either secretly penned it or if he gets some kind of royalty off it because I, when I read this, I was thinking, wow, this could have been written by J. Cal. Yeah, he would have said it right into the camera. He would be like, all right, cut right here. Message to LeBron <laughs> yeah. James. We will crush you. <laughs> exactly. We will destroy you. It's a good impression. You got Thank you. I've been that's working on it. I've had a couple pretty years. Good. Yeah, that's a pretty good impression. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's also uh, it's written in like comic sans in a sort of comically oversized font. It's almost like it's something you'd see on Live Journal or something. Uh, Is it real? Do, you, do we even know it's we, real? You know, we don't no, know. No, it's real. No, he, ver it, it, oh, he verified, verified it. Yeah. Okay. And and he it's goes, on NBA.com. Yeah. I mean, it's on the Cleveland Cavaliers official no, he page. He goes a little over the top. I mean, he said, the curse of Cleveland is going to follow you. We're yeah. going to win an NBA championship before you do. I mean, I was quite surprised that he went this far. I mean, this is like this is like a 15-year-old girl yeah. that got her heart broken for the first time, yeah. being spurned by you know the cool jock at school. I mean, uh, well, I feel you got to feel like you got to feel bad for Cleveland. You got to feel I, I, like the whole way that they set up the the press release or the press. Uh, Interview last night, the yeah. the, re the big reveal that they had. It was like, I'm all, there's no way they can do this and not announce that he's staying in Cleveland. You know, you can't go through all this and then and then just leave him, just leave him hanging out there. It was like it was. I felt bad. I felt bad for him. It's like, yeah, reading the letter. It's like, yeah. Uh, I, I, and I got to admit, I was kind of confused by why I had the kids there. I, I really were because <laughs> even the kids in the background, you know, LeBron's like, all right. I'm going to be going to South Beach playing for the Heat. And the kids were like, oh, no, he didn't. Yeah, like, <laughs> he's leaving. Oh. He's leaving. I mean, nobody clapped. I mean, yeah, no, no, it was, like, no it was so laughed. depressing. It was kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, I, I did, really didn't get the point of the children. I think he's watching one too many, you know, like political stump speech where you just keep kids in the background. Maybe yeah. he, he didn't think anyone would throw well, anything they, at him. They, they were raising money for the Boys and Girls yeah, Club. So right. that's, you know, no, that was I, a tie-in. I, I got that. But just have a big sign. It says you don't actually need real boys and girls. <laughs> yeah. You know. I would have rather had him sitting up there and, you know, do some stuff, have the hats, you know, pick the, you know, draw it out, a little drama and everything, then select the hat. I want a big banner to fall from the back yeah. and then yeah. have the heat, you know, the heat or sign. It, and I want it, Riley it, it, and yeah. D. Wade coming out then he and everybody's high fiving and it's a celebration. You should have done a telethon right there. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever city in that hour gives <laughs> pledges the most money the Boys and Girls Club gets him. Oh, I mean, that if he really wanted great. to do yeah, that, that, that would have been wow. a good way to do it. That's the way to do it. That would have been great. Been like perfect. But, so we're talking about startups. So, and I was, I was thinking about this and just kind of bring it into the concept of what we're talking about here. The choice that he went through to, what do you think? What did you just think of his choice to go to Miami? Let me, put, let me ask you. I, I've got doubts that the three of them can play together well. And they've used so much of their money to get those three that they're really going to have just a team of scrubs around them. So it's not even like the teams of the 80s, right? If you look at the 80s and you look at the great players, look at Lakers. So they had Magic. Kareem and Worthy, okay? But then they were surrounded by Byron Scott, A.C. Green, you know, coming off the bench. They had an amazing team, mm -hmm. Celtics. Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale. Where, okay, they so had where, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge. I mean, if, was, if you were LeBron, where would you have gone? I would have stayed and done it in Cleveland. Because right, if, you, if, you look, if, you look at the, if you look at the greatest players of the last, you know, two, three decades... Yep. Um, 
Magic, Jordan, Kobe, Bird, they, they've Kobe, they've done it with their home teams. Right. Now that said, people have short memories, and as soon as he wins the first championship, we're all going to forget this. I don't think so. And what people forget is, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did the same thing. Even if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had actually already won a championship with Oscar Robinson, and left the Bucks and went to the Lakers, and he was. He was a player in his time that was not liked by the public but media. He went, right, but he went to the Lakers. He created the Lakers at that point. He didn't go. He didn't join a. He didn't go join the two other guys that just announced two days before that they were going there. He he went. He built the team around him. So he actually built that. So as an entrepreneur, as a startup guy, you'd stay in Cleveland. I would have said the same thing. I would have stayed in Cleveland because you want that responsibility on your shoulders. I think it got to LeBron. He's been doing this for seven years now, with it completely carrying everybody on his back. I think he finally got to the point where he sees this opportunity to go play with two other guys where he doesn't have to carry all the weight. And I don't know. Maybe he's more of a big I mean, look, company they, guy they, versus the last a startup two years guy. In the league, possibly. They had the best record in the league. And they got to the conference final, so you can't put that on management. You can't put that on, you know, maybe the coach is partly to blame. And I didn't think they had the best coach. But, you know, at that point, they've got just as good a shot as anyone. I really do th I, I think that he was not prepared for the amount of backlash he's getting. And I think as soon as that first championship is won, everyone will forget about this. And no one will talk about the legacy or any of this stuff. I just have questions of whether those three can really play effectively together and I think you know we'll find out soon enough. Yeah. I think the rest of the world thinks that LeBron's a much better player than he thinks he is because we all would have had him stay in Cleveland or go someplace else where he could build it on his own and do it on his own rather than thinking he can pass off some of the responsibility onto these other two guys. He I think he needed that. He was like afraid to continue to do it on his own. Yeah. Well uh we're at a hundred minutes we gotta we gotta wrap it up. Okay. We're over we're over time. Uh, so we, we should we should extend the contest. So uh, for DNA Mail, if you tweet at DNA Mail uh, and thank at Jason Nazar and at JR Lunch. JR Lunch. JR Lunch. So mention those three names in your tweet. Uh, tweet out a thank you to at DNA Mail, and then I guess at the end of the day or maybe the we'll end of the weekend, them and help we'll, we'll yeah we'll we'll pick a winner from Twitter and we'll uh, we'll we'll send them a free month of DNA okay. Mail. And then uh, if you're local and in Southern California area, this Wednesday in Santa Monica at the Milken Institute. Uh, we're going to be running our next Startups and Censored. It's a monthly event that we do that brings out lots of people in Southern California, entrepreneurs, technologists, um, investors. We've got typically about 300 people that come out to each event. They're totally free events. And we're doing the next one this coming Wednesday, the 14th. We're going to have uh, JR as our guest, Ben Smith, who runs Merchant Circle up in the Bay, and then Mark Suster, who you all know is the host of This Week in VC. Oh, yeah. It'll be a great event. Looking forward to having you all. Um, and Lon, thank you for all your help thank today. You. you did a great job. And thank JR, you. amazing guest. Thank you for sharing your story and Thanks, you know how do we got to where you're at right now and all the good piece of advice. And uh, thank you all for watching. The show is going to be replayed today, I think. Uh, yeah, we're going to rerun it today at its normal time. And then you can see it any time. Just go to thisweekend.com and go right. to the This Weekend Startups page, and you can see the show. And then most importantly, Jason Cow, we're all wishing you good luck. <laughs> Kick ass in the tournament. Keep taking people down. Uh, and, you know, bring home a big prize for everybody here at Mahalo and This Week in Startups. Thanks, guys.